So I wanted to talk to you this evening about a phenomenon I'm calling misbehaving conditionals. Um, so to tell you about what it is for a conditional to misbehave, first I need to tell you about what a conditional is, and then I need to tell you about what uh, it is for a conditional to behave properly so that we can then talk about how some conditionals fail to do that. So first let me uh, uh, maybe familiar to those of you in linguistics or have taken introductory philosophy classes, but uh, a sentence with the form if A is true, then C is true is an indicative conditional. Now, indicative conditionals are just one important class of conditionals. There are other conditionals which are, which are sometimes called subjunctive or counterfactual conditionals that um, have to do with what the world would be like if certain things had been true. But for tonight, I just want to focus on indicative conditionals, where the antecedent, the A part of the conditional, specifies um, some question about whether some claim is actually true in the world. So something like, um, you know, if there's food in the other room, then there will be a lot of people there, or something like that. So A is the antecedent of our conditional, and C is the consequent of our conditional. And the full sentence, if A is true, then C is true, is our um, indicative conditional. Now, usually, indicative conditionals obey a number of different principles or rules of logic. I have three of them up on the board, or up on the uh, slide, not because they're the only ones, but because there are some particularly important and, um, and uh, widely used rules that most conditionals seem to obey. So they seem to obey modus ponens. If A is true, then C is true. A, therefore C. So you know that if there's food in the next room, there will be a lot of people there. And you also know that there's food in the next room, then it seems like you can infer that there will be a lot of people there. Um, that's called modus ponens, or the mode of putting. Modus tollens is uh, a little bit different. If A is true, then C is true. C is false. In other words, not C is true. Therefore, A is false, or not A. So if Tom is home, then the lights are on. But look, the lights are off. Therefore, Tom isn't home. So if the antecedent is true, then the consequence is true. The consequence is false. Therefore, the antecedent is false. The last one I want to talk about is called reasoning by cases. Either A1 is true or A2 is true. One of these two things is true. If the first one is true, then C. If the second thing is true, then C. Therefore, C. The, um, there are only two ways out of the building. Either way, you uh, confront the exact same monster. Therefore, you confront that monster. OK, so those are three uh, rules that most conditionals seem to obey. And that's what I mean by a behaving conditional. It's a conditional that's honoring, that's uh, that we're able to infer in accord with all of these rules of inference. But curiously, some indicative conditionals look to violate a couple of these uh, rules. And in particular, indicative conditionals with so-called modal words like should, ought, must, might, and likely in their consequence seem to behave quite strangely. These are words that involve um, ways that the, not that the world is, but that the world um, might be, or could be, or should be, or likely is. Uh, let me give you a few examples of that. So imagine that we're in a room with no windows, and we don't know whether it's raining out, and I offer you the following argument that it's not raining. I say, look, if it's raining, the streets must be wet. But for all I know, this, uh, the streets might not be wet. After all, I can't see out the windows. Therefore, it's not raining. Good. Chuckles, right? So <laughs> that argument shouldn't persuade anyone, and I hope that it didn't persuade anyone. But notice that this conditional, or this inference that I just went through, uh, obeys the form of modus tollens. It obeys the form if A, then C, not C, therefore not A. So this looks like a kind of conditional that's misbehaving by violating our modus tollens rule. Here's another case of uh, conditional that's misbehaving by violating modus tollens. This comes from a, an example uh, by a, a professor at Berkeley named Seth Yeltsin. So imagine we have 100 uh, marbles in an urn, a mix of green and yellow, big and small, and I have on this chart, we've got 10 big green marbles, we've got 30 big yellow marbles, we've got 50 small green marbles, and uh, 10 small yellow marbles. Here's another bad argument. Look, if X is big, then it's likely yellow, because look, of all the big marbles, we've got 40 big marbles, and 30 of them are yellow. So if it's big, it's likely yellow. But look, X isn't likely yellow. 60 of them are green, whereas only 40 of them are yellow. So the marble isn't likely yellow. Therefore, it's not big. Again, that argument shouldn't persuade anyone that if I reach into the urn and I don't, I don't just, you know, I just imagine I can't tell the difference between a big and a small uh, marble in the urn. And I say, here's my argument that the marble in my urn must not be big. If it's big, it's likely yellow, but it's not likely yellow, therefore it's not big. Again, it looks like that's a bad argument, but notice that that argument seems also to fit the model of, of Moses Tolens. Here's another case that uses a, a moral notion, a notion of a moral ought or a moral should. So this comes from a paper by uh, McFarland and Kolodny in, uh, in 2010. So here's the, the puzzle. Ten miners are trapped in either shaft A or shaft B, but we do not know which. 
Flood waters threaten to flood the shafts. We have enough sandbags to block one shaft, but not both. If we block one shaft, all of the water will go into the other shaft, killing any miners inside of it. If we block neither shaft, both shafts will fill halfway with water, and just one miner, the lowest in the shaft, uh, will be killed. So the way that it works is we don't know where the miners are. We could guess. If we guess right, then we'll get lucky and we'll save all 10 of them. But if we guess wrong, we get unlucky, all 10 die. If we do nothing, then only one of them is going to die, no matter which shaft they're in. And the intuitive thought that McFarland and Kolodny are inviting us to share here is that what you ought to do is nothing. You ought to not guess and gamble with 10 lives, 10 deaths versus zero. You ought to just uh, cut your losses, allow just one person to die. Of course, that's very unfortunate, but it would be reckless to take a 50-50 gamble on possibly causing 10 people to die. Well, here's an argument that looks to fit reasoning by cases that looks like a bad argument. Look, either the miners are in shaft A or shaft B. If they're in shaft A, then we ought to block shaft A. If they're in shaft B, we ought to block shaft B. So either we ought to block shaft A or we ought to block <laughs> shaft B. Either way, we ought to block one of them. Again, that looks like the wrong conclusion. Um, McFarland and Kolodny insist we ought to block neither shaft. And so any argument that, that entails that we ought to either block shaft A or block shaft B would have to be wrong. But notice that this again looks to be a violation of reasoning by cases. We've constructed a conditional that misbehaved, in this case, not by violating modus tollens, but by violating reasoning by cases. Okay, one reaction I think that some people have had to these kinds of cases is that maybe there's some sense in which logic doesn't apply to these modal uh, bits of discourse. That maybe logic just doesn't apply to indicative conditionals that have these modal words like should and ought and likely in the consequence of their conditional. So maybe the right thing to think is that these rules that we have, modus ponens, modus tollens, reasoning by cases, they really only apply when you're dealing with words that are modal free, when you're, when you're dealing with conditionals that have absolutely no modal words in the consequence. And so the right thing to say about these is that they're not really misbehaving conditionals because the logic of these conditionals was really only meant to apply to modal free uh, discourse to begin with. Um, but I think that this reaction that some people have had is a dramatic overreaction. I think it would be totally disastrous for lots and lots of reasons to just say, oh, logic just doesn't apply once, once you've mentioned the word should, or once you've mentioned the word likely, or once you've mentioned the word probable, or once you've mentioned the word ought. Logic is just out the window. And the reason for that, um, well, one reason for that is that there are a whole bunch of different places in philosophy and in economics and in decision theory and in game theory where we appeal to so-called dominance principles. And a dominance principle basically says, look, if you know that no matter which way um, the world might be, imagine the world might be such that P is true and the world might be such that P is false, but regardless of whether P is true, the best thing for me to do is to phi. Seems like you can go ahead and phi. You want to phi because it doesn't matter how the world turns out, regardless of whether P is true or not. Um, so a, a classic case of this, which some of you might have been familiar with, is uh, the so-called Newcomb case. I won't go into all the details of the Newcomb case, but the way the Newcomb case works is that you don't know how much money is in an opaque box. It could either be a million dollars or zero dollars. But you know for sure that there's $10,000 in the transparent box. You can see right through it. See the $10,000. And now you're given a choice. Do you want both boxes? Um, or do you want just the opaque box? And the reasoning that a lot of people have found quite plausible, quite compelling in this particular case, is that, look, I don't know how much money is in the opaque box. There's either a million dollars there or zero. But either way, no matter how the world turns out, I do $10,000 better by taking both boxes. And so obviously, I should take both boxes because I'll do $10,000 better um, by taking both boxes than I would by taking the opaque box alone. Now, the Newcomb problem itself has a further wrinkle, which I don't have time to get into um, in this particular case. But the important point is that that kind of reasoning, the reasoning, look, P is either true or false. If P is true, then I ought to fi. If P is false, then I ought to fi. Therefore, I ought to fi. Notice two things about that. First of all, it's an example of reasoning by cases. A1 or A2. If A1, then C. If A2, then C. Therefore, C. And second of all, notice that it's got an ought. It's got a should in the consequent. So if we were to just say, uh, look, these principles that we articulate, all they apply to is um, conditionals that don't have any modal words in it. That looks like that's going to rule as invalid all of these dominance principles that get a lot of us to endorse the decision theories that we endorse, and that falls out of a lot of different approaches to decision theory and game theory in philosophy and politics and economics and a lot of different fields. So where does this all leave us? Well, 
um, it leaves us with uh, two philosophical challenges. The first is to explain what's going on with these modal constructions and why they sometimes violate these very plausible patterns of inference. And the second is to do so in a way that explains why they sometimes obey those very same patterns. So what is going on with these uh, conditionals that involve modal consequence, which makes them such that they behave really weirdly in the McFarland and Kolodny case, the minor case, and they behave really oddly with the rainy case, and they behave really oddly with this case where I'm reaching into an urn and I'm guessing about what color and what size the marble might be. And yet they seem to behave perfectly appropriately when we deal with these dominance principle types of reasoning involving um, the two-box case that I talked about before, or other cases in decision theory and, um, and game theory. And I have some suspicions about how that might go, but um, it's, it's really interesting because what I think it suggests is that there's a really deep difference between what's going on with this modal discourse and what's going on with non-modal discourse. And there's a lot to say about that. I only have 15 minutes, so that's all I'll have to say uh, for tonight, but thank you very much. <laughs>